Hello, everyone. Hi, everyone. One in 10 children have a serious food allergy, a frightening statistic, especially mm. if you're a mum starting your child on solids with foods they've never tried before. It can be really, really stressful. <laughs> We've all been there. <laughs> That's what we're going to be chatting about today on Mother Doctor Nurse. So thank you so much for joining us. For those of you who haven't met us yet, my name is Dr. Deb. I'm a holistic pediatrician and mum to two young girls. And as always, joining us is the wonderful Sarah Hunstead, pediatric nurse and founder of CPR Kids, where you mm -hmm. learn basic first aid and life support for your children. So thanks for joining us. We are very happy to answer questions. If you can just type them in the comments. And we also really love to know where you're coming from and where you're listening to us from. So ask away. Obviously, this only if you're watching this live. And also, I cannot give personal medical advice in this format. So there you go. Welcome, everyone. Yeah. Thank you, Deb. And um, what we'd love you to do too is tag anybody in the comments below who you think will benefit from this good evidence-based information as well. So please do that. And Deb and I are coming from Gadigal and Bidjigal land today as well. So Deb, when it comes to food allergy, this is a subject that we could be talking about for, I imagine, maybe two to three days um, <laughs> rather than the next uh, 20 minutes. So we've been, thank you everyone who has sent in your questions about food allergy. Allergy. And what we've done is we've taken the top three questions, and I'm sure Deb will elaborate more on that as well. But um, the first what well, the first one that really comes to mind with what um, all of our audience has been asking is that when it comes to food allergy in babies, um, you know, what, what what causes it? Why does it happen? Is there an answer to that, or is it still a big question mark? Okay, so. There is a bit of a question mark. So we know that there's a genetic tendency, but we can't pinpoint exactly which child is going to have that food allergy. So what do I mean by genetic tendency? There's a group of what we call atopic conditions, and that includes things like eczema, food allergies, asthma, and hay fever. Mm -hmm. So if there's a family history of that, or if your child has eczema, um, they are definitely at a higher risk of developing food allergies. I say eczema because we also talk about this allergic food march, or sorry, this atopic march, um, where they kind of progress from eczema to food allergies um, and then asthma and hay fever. So that, that's often the, the um, order that it comes in. So certainly we are already suspicious um, of children who may develop allergies. And I guess the one that stands out, as I've already mentioned, is a child with moderate to severe eczema is definitely at a higher risk. Yep. Um, then, I mean, I, I pause because... You know, you, Sarah, know this and a lot of people who follow me know I'm intensely interested in the microbiome and how that impacts on our children's health. And definitely there is a role that the microbiome plays. So it really, a food allergy really is just showing us there's, that there's an imbalance in our children's immune system where they're recognizing a food as something that is foreign and that they have to fight off. So it's mm -hmm. the body mounting an immune response against a food abnormally so we know which is different from a food intolerance which i'm very happy to talk about in another session um, mm -hmm. but i think today we'll just stick to the food allergies so um you know who's going to get it as i said the stats are very high especially in australia but certainly those are the children who are more at risk yep okay well yep so i guess we just need to watch this space a little bit more don't we mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so yeah we know, well, we, we don't really know, but you've elaborated there on, you know, possible reasons a child may have a food allergy. But what are the top foods that cause food allergy? Yeah. So I talk about, you know, nine foods causing 90% of food allergies, um, mm. just as a general, obviously, you know, it can potentially be any food. And mm. those nine foods are dairy, soy, wheat, peanuts, tree nuts, shellfish, fish, um, sesame seeds, and what have I forgotten, Sarah? I've just had a blank. I have no, I, mm, well, I eggs. have some. Sorry, eggs. eggs. That's it. <laughs> yes. 
I was going through, I'm thinking to myself, Sorry. I'm thinking to myself, okay, meat, dairy, what, what, where are we going? Where are we going with yeah, this? Yeah, no, eggs. no, no, eggs. Perfect. I know you have it in the beginning of my list. I don't yeah. know why I didn't. That's why I, yeah. I got out of sync. But um, those are yeah. the most common foods. And when we talk about introducing solids, and I suspect we'll get into this in a little bit more detail now, you know, and we talk about high allergen foods or, you know, foods that are more likely to cause an allergic reaction. Those are the foods that we're referring to, yeah. allergenic foods. Yeah. And so uh, I guess one of the other big questions we get, and remember there are lots and lots of resources for this too, so we will be popping in the comments below um, a lot of this further reading and resources that are out there for you that, of course, are peak bodies and all evidence-based. And I'm sure Deb's got some resources on her Instagram as well. I have no yeah. doubt that you've got that. Um, but so we talked about the, um, the nine foods that are most common um, that cause allergies, but is there a way to prevent allergies in our kids? <laughs> the billion dollar question <laughs> there's certainly ways that we can try and decrease the risk for our children so mm -hmm. i've already touched on the microbiome and that's a whole topic in itself and i'm actually mm -hmm. um in the process of putting together a wonderful resource for parents um so watch the space for that that's for sure i think it's gonna be a great one um but that is it's a bit too intricate to go into now so we know mm -hmm. that looking after our children's gut microbiome does help that's number one mm -hmm. the other thing that we can look at are other like vitamin d deficiency we think that can have an impact being too hygienic can have an impact you know that all these things can factor in but mm -hmm. i guess the most well established is really exposing our children to this food in a tiniest manner mm -hmm. so what do i mean by that you know in you know probably you know a little while ago a couple of decades ago it was mm -hmm. You know, don't give these foods until they're older, you know, wait until they're after one to give nuts mm -hmm. and, you know, all these other things. But actually, that's all flipped on its head. And what we now know is the early introduction of these allergenic foods, remember those foods I mentioned, actually decreases a child's risk of developing a food allergy. Mm -hmm. So, um, and there's a, there's a recommended way to do that, which I'm happy mm -hmm. to go into. Um, yeah. But certainly early introduction is the way to go mm -hmm. and by early introduction yeah. let me just clar clarify <laughs> on that what i'm talking about is when a child is ready developmentally to start solids so mm -hmm. so i'm not talking about um you know a child you know putting peanut butter in their you know in their milk when they in their two or two months or something like that yeah. i'm talking about yeah. you know when they're developmentally ready to start solids Yep, absolutely. And, the, you know, the guidelines are very clear and we'll pop a link down for anybody who wants to see what the Australian Society of Clinical Immunology and Allergy Guidelines are for introduction of solids, which um, is, you know, you've got a really friendly way of, um, of of sorting all this information out, Deb, so we'll make sure that your is, is in there too. But anybody who wants to go back to that peak body clearly states there that um, introduction of these allergenic foods, um, you know, around six months, not before four months, and, of course, in a manner that is developmentally appropriate as you've just said and there's lots of suggestions as well on the nip allergies in the bub website as well which is developed by ASCIA which are the peak body too so lots and lots and lots of resources out there which is a good thing mm -hmm. it's definitely mm -hmm. a good thing so we've talked about those foods um we've talked about you know ways that you may be able to prevent including that introduction of those foods uh, you know before the age of 12 months and sorry, please excuse my voice at the moment. I've just had COVID and it is starting to fade a little bit now as it was. So, but anyway, <laughs> back to this. Um, one of the questions that we get is certainly, how would I know if my baby was having an allergic reaction? What kinds of signs and symptoms are we looking out for? And I think what's really important here is that we define the difference between having an allergic reaction and anaphylaxis or severe allergic reaction as well, because what we're going to do is going to be different. So Deb, do you want to explain what your child might look like or what might happen? Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, I'm pausing because there's a whole spectrum, mm -hmm. okay? Yeah. And, um, you know, the, the classic, you know, picture that people, you know, think about is a child with a rash. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, that's something called urticaria, which we've actually spoken about before, Sarah. Mm -hmm. And that's a typical raised red, blotchy, very itchy rash that your child can <laughs> develop. Um, the, other, the other symptoms can be, facial swelling that can mm -hmm. be lips that can be around the eyes that can be anywhere on the face um, 
And more worryingly, it can actually also be of, of the tongue and the throat. Mm. So mm -hmm. if your child's voice changes, if they start to cough, that becomes more worrying. If they start mm -hmm. to develop difficulties, breathing, wheezing, and this is aging into anaphylaxis now, um, mm -hmm. plus or minus their um, level of consciousness changes that can become pale, floppy. Mm -hmm. um, and the other aspect is abdominal symptoms. So a degree of tummy pain or vomiting. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's kind of an evolution of, of um, symptoms that, that you can see. I do just want to flag, though, that you don't have to have a rash to have anaphylaxis. Exactly. So be aware of that. And it is mm -hmm. about seeing your child as a whole. And really, mm -hmm. for me, the, the urgent, urgent signs are the coughing, the wheezing, the change in voice, any mm -hmm. change in um, level of consciousness or being alert, Mm -hmm. um, and going very pale and floppy. Yep, absolutely. And I think one of the, you know, one of the big questions that we do get all the time as well is, well, what do I do if my child um, does have, uh, you know, an anaphylaxis? And so what yep. I would love to do, if that's okay, is share my screen and mm. actually go through um, what, Oh, I'm just sorry. There we go. Ah, there we go. Okay. While, while you're bringing you, that up, Sarah, yes. um, Please, I just want to flag that the reason, uh, sorry, the reason why we always recommend to start allergenic foods in an early meal, in other words, a breakfast or a lunch meal, um, is so that we can watch for these symptoms. Because, um, you know, the difference between, again, an allergy and intolerance is that with a food allergy, the symptoms can appear within minutes to actually mm -hmm. a couple of hours, not usually a day or two later, that will be very unusual, but it mm -hmm. can happen within a couple of hours. So you can imagine if you're giving your child, you know, their first dose of peanut butter at, mm -hmm. you know, six o'clock at night, and then they're going to sleep at seven, you're not there to observe it. So just be aware of that. Sorry yeah, to interrupt. No, no, that's an excellent point. It's actually a really, really important thing. So what I've got up here on the screen is a generic first aid plan for anaphylaxis. So we're talking about anaphylaxis here, which is the severe um, allergic reaction. And you'll see here, this is just such a good resource. I will pop this in the comments below for you to print out at home. If your child has a known allergy or, or anaphylaxis, your doctor will actually fill out a personalized action plan. So this, this is the generic one. This is different. If your child does and have a known allergy this is a sensational thing to keep with your first aid kit so that you do actually have this resource um, at home to refer to if you suspect your child is having an allergic reaction so you can see here that it actually talks about the signs of mod mild to moderate then what to look for and then what to do for the action for allergic reaction and then we scroll down and you can actually see here um, that they talk about the signs to look for, um, whether it is for anaphylaxis. And then the action plan. This is the part that I really want to go through. So if this is the first time your child is having anaphylaxis, or if, you know, obviously the first aid is the same, if your child is known, the first thing you're going to do is lay them down flat. So what we don't want is a child to be walking around or to be held upright in arms. It's really, really important that that they are laid flat in your arms. And if they are having difficulty breathing, then you can sit their torso up, but make sure that their legs are out flat. Okay, so this is an important thing. And um, if they are unconscious, then you're going to roll them onto their side into the recovery position. Okay, so if there is an adrenaline injector available, so that is your EpiPen or your Anapen, um, then you're going to give it. You are going, to, that's if there is one available. You're going to call an ambulance on triple zero. You are not going to hang up or you are going to follow their instructions and calmly and clearly tell them where you are and what is happening. Really important. You're then going to follow the directions that the triple um, zero operator is going to give you. 
okay? So that's really, really important. And remember that if your child uh, does have asthma and also has anaphylaxis, you always give the adrenaline auto-injector first before you give the Ventolin, and that's an important thing, okay? So, and remember, one of the big things, and this is, um, you know, after many, many, many years in the emergency department, one thing that we would often have um, people coming in, their child having anaphylaxis, known anaphylaxis, but they've been a bit worried about whether or not mm. to give mm -hmm. the um, adrenaline injector. They're like, oh, what happens if they didn't really need it and I gave it? You know what? It is not Give going it. to do your child yeah. any harm. Give the adrenaline injector. Give the EpiPen or the Anapen. They're the two brands that are available here in Australia. Please, please, please give it. It will not do them any harm if you give it to them and they don't need it. But what is harmful is if they don't receive it when they actually do. So if in doubt, give the adrenaline auto injector, please. Okay. Really important. There we go. Oh, I'll just, there we go. Make us big again. Okay. So I will put a link to that first aid chart. And remember that is the generic first aid chart down in the comments below. And the other thing that was on there that I didn't mention is you'll see there's a QR code. Scan that QR code with your phone. It takes you to videos on how to give an EpiPen and an AnaPen. So that if you've never done that before, or you're not sure, you can watch that and be more confident to be able to give that if you ever need to. Because you might just be at the cafe and the person at the table next to you um, it turns around and says, get my EpiPen. I'm having um, a severe allergic reaction, which is what happened to me once. Of course. <laughs> it's going to happen to anyone, Sarah, to you. Yes. <laughs> All your stories. <laughs> uh -huh. That's it. So, Deb, what would you like to um, go through now? Is there anything else that you'd like to tell us about um, what to do if your child or you suspect your child is having an allergic reaction? Um, I'm just going to, I'm going to talk about something else, actually. Sorry, is there? Okay. I, I, I will often get um, families who say to me they've tested on the skin before. Oh, right. Yeah. So in order to reassure them that their child's not going to have an allergic reaction. And I uh -huh. just want to say that there is no evidence that mm -hmm. patch testing on skin has mm -hmm. any correlation to whether or not a child will have a food allergy. Um if you want to test anywhere, you can test on the inside of the lip. Um, okay. But again, it's probably better just to give them a little bit. And yep. what do we usually recommend when you do start high, these highly allergenic foods, give a small amount mm -hmm. consecutive days for a few days, just to give your child that repeated exposure to ensure mm -hmm. that they're not going to have a reaction. Because typically, and I'm doing an in inverted commas because it's not every time, typically your child will only have a reaction once they've already been exposed but mm -hmm. it, that's not always the case. Okay. Um, I'm just trying to think of any other. Sorry, do you I've, want to ask me? I've got one. I've got one. And you may have already answered it, but my foggy post-COVID brain mightn't have heard yeah, it. Sure. Um, so repeat it anyway. So when it comes to introducing foods to your child, I know you talked about the timing of it, but what about new foods? Can you, for example, mix the mm. egg and the peanut butter together or should we be doing this separately? Only only if they're already established on the one. So mm -hmm. with um, the non-allergenic foods, so your vegetables, your fruits, you know, things that they are very unlikely to react to, you mm -hmm. can introduce multiple at a time, you know, one every day, one morning, afternoon, doesn't really matter. Um, mm -hmm. When it comes to the allergenic foods, we say introduce a new one every three to five days. Um, okay. I think five days is just easier, um, mm -hmm. but that's just me personally because I think it's, quite a task getting solids ready for your child anyway and um, yeah. so the reason being is that exactly what i've said we want those multiple exposures we want to see if your child's going to react because if you're introducing two of these allergenic foods at a time or very close together mm -hmm. then you don't know which it is you don't know which is the mm -hmm. culprit yeah. so that's exactly what we do yeah excellent and Debbie, i mean you just add in by the way you just keep yeah. on adding foods into your child's diet yeah. And I'm sure that I have just, uh, once again, with my foggy post COVID brain, just didn't hear you say this, but <laughs> um, I think one of the important things is realizing that it may not be the first time that you give the food to your child. I think that's a big myth out there that, you know, if mm. your child hasn't had, you know, you're giving it for the first time, they didn't have a reaction the second time, they're definitely not going to have one. I think, you know, busting that myth is also important too. Mm. 
Now, exactly, and there's, and there's no and there's no need to start these foods in the car outside an emergency department. Oh, I can like it yeah. and go because I hear of a lot mm. of families that do that as well because they're so yeah. stressed about it, which is which yeah. is hard. It's a it's yeah. a hard space to sit in. Yeah, it is. But how do you relax? Is the wrong word. I was looking. Yeah, but how do you feel more confident to be able to do this? It's by with knowledge. And how do you do that? By listening to us. <laughs> and then, us doing one of Sarah's courses. <laughs> that's it. It's about knowing what to do. And, you know, we will yeah. be putting a lot of resources down below as well. So read, 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 understand from the good, reputable resources that we're just showing you. Don't just Google stuff because that just gets scary. No. Okay, no. don't, don't, yeah, don't do that. All right, so that's important. Now, if there are any questions, now is the time to ask them. Please post them in the comments below. But apart from that, Deb, what last pearl of information would you like to give everyone what's the what's an what's the thing that stands out to you the most that you want everybody to know about allergy in kids um gosh that's putting me on the spot because you know i always go back to the mm. microbiome and what we can do yeah. to support our children and potentially prevent things and yeah. you know being a being married to a man who has a multiple food allergies and having children with no food allergies i'm very grateful um, but honestly, I think it's about being aware of which foods your child can react to and then mm -hmm. being alert to what the possible signs are. Excellent. Thank you very much, Deb. All right, yeah, everyone. Thank well, you. We will see you again next week. Same time. Yep. Same place. Yep. With another um, fascinating subject, which I can't actually remember what one it is that we're doing, but you know, we'll put it out there. Keep looking at our pages because we'll tell you what it is and then just come and join us. It's that simple. All right. Thank you Thanks very much. Everyone. Everyone. Thanks, Sarah. Bye.